Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so grateful to my dear friend uh, Tracy for inviting me to join you this morning. And before I say anything else, I want to recognize Tracy for everything she's done to establish and, and develop this wonderful organization. So please join me in thanking Tracy, Tra the incomparable Tracy Meadley for all of It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. And I want to make sure that I have a proper entree to this wonderful uh, group. So while most of my Creole relations are in Louisiana, I want you to know that their name is Lano, L-A-N-A-U-X. My great-grandmother's name was Odile Lano, and while both my father and my grandfather were named Joseph George Lano Marston, they both were so proud of their Creole roots that they introduced themselves and were known by Lano Marston. So I hope that increases my credibility with all of you at least a little bit. I want to thank Tracy for introducing me and especially for not introducing me as the last person who will ever let you down, the person everyone's dying to meet, or the guy with the brave personality. As I said, I'm the municipal cemeteries manager for the city of Mobile. Working in cemeteries as I have for 50 years may seem somewhat gruesome. It is work in which sadness and grief are everyday circumstances, but it is also a unique and fascinating occupation. Helping the people of the community during one of the most difficult times of their lives and being a steward and custodian of a very significant part of the history of the community, community is very rewarding. But I'll begin by saying that if anyone here has experienced a recent death among your family or friends, please accept my sincere condolences. But today I'll ask all of you to think of cemeteries from a cultural, historic, and artistic point of view, and not just as places of sadness and grief. I love making presentations to heritage groups like this one, and while this is the first time I've spoken to your group, I hope you'll invite me again. Now, I know it's strange for a speaker to start talking about coming again before they've barely gotten started the first time. So I'll explain. I've given multiple presentations to a number of heritage groups in the Mobile and Baltimore County area. And on each visit, I'm able to talk about a different, specific topic. But for my first presentation to each group, I'd like to provide some educational information about 19th century Victorian era cemeteries in general, as well as information about the history, people, geography, art, and other information about Magnolia Cemetery in particular. And as uh, Tracy said, we, we're kind of on a deadline today, but I won't use all our time, so we should have time, at least a little bit of time, for some questions and answers. A lot of this presentation is very closely timed, so I won't be able to stop for comments and questions, so I'd appreciate it. If you have a question, keep it in mind and uh, ask me when I'm finished. This morning, we'll look at cemeteries and burial customs. We'll explore some of the myths and legends and some of the facts about concealing those who have passed away. You may even learn that things you have believed as absolute facts all of your life are, in fact, myths and urban legends. Sunrise over an old cemetery can be strange, beautiful, and mysterious. This is a Victorian burial ground, and it was in these old cemeteries that the memorial art form reached its zenith. I hope this presentation will be a sunrise on your knowledge of old cemeteries. This can only serve as an introduction to the world of 19th century cemeteries, burial customs, and funerary art but I hope it will encourage you to visit old cemeteries and do everything you can to help preserve them. Ritualistic treatment of the dead is as old as humankind and has taken many, many forms over the years and does so today. From the hanging caskets on the Yangtze River in China to the vulture-assisted burials of the Himalayas. Even before people lived in permanent settlements, they understood the need for concealing the dead. 
As villages grew into towns and cities, the need for graveyards was a priority. Both of these words, bury and grave, are of Germanic origin. Bury means to hide or conceal, and grave comes from the old Germanic word grafen, meaning to dig. So these were places where the living dug holes to conceal the dead. Much of what we know about ancient peoples comes from studying their tombs, burial places, and the artifacts placed in the graves with them. From the ancient catacombs of Rome to the natural and carved tombs of the Middle East to the burial mounds of Europe and the Americas. From a simple carn, a pile of rocks covering a grave, to the splendor of the pyramids, humans have taken burial, the concealing of the body, from a simple hole in the ground to the point of elevating the dead to the status of gods. Let's take a look at 19th century cemeteries and the often very strange customs of our grandparents and great-grandparents. These, of course, are not graveyards, but cemeteries, a word much preferred by the always proper Victorians. The word cemetery comes from the Greek word komenteria, with a K, meaning a sleeping place or bedchamber. These were no longer places to dig holes and conceal the dead. Now they were places of sleep for the mortal remains of departed loved ones. William Gladstone, the four-time Prime Minister of Great Britain during the reign of Queen Victoria, once said, Show me the way in which a people cares for its dead, and I will accurately measure the level of their civilization. This statement says a great deal about the Victorians. It shows the Victorian attitude that there is a proper way to do everything, and of course, their way was the proper way. The Victorian love of grandeur and massive scale can be seen in the houses they built, in the clothes they wore and changed up to five times each day, even the dresses worn by widows for a minimum of a year after their husband's death had to conform to very strict rules of style, color, etiquette, and taste. Everything surrounding burial was done in the proper way. Their caskets were trimmed in silver. They had jewelry made using the hair of the departed loved one. Professional photographers took staged death portraits. These were sometimes group pictures, family pictures. Gruesome perhaps to us, but very popular and most meaningful to the Victorian family. The history of cemeteries in Mobile began in 1711. Oldest records and maps indicate a burial ground just outside the old fort. You might be surprised to learn that when you stand in the atrium of the Mobile City County Building, you are probably standing on the site of that first burial ground. Its location is about all we know of that first cemetery. Mobile's first real municipal cemetery was called Campo Santo, Sacred Field. It was located in the area now occupied by the Catholic Cathedral and Cathedral Square. In 1819, Mobile was in the grips of a terrible yellow fever epidemic which caused 274 deaths in just two months. Campo Santo was rapidly filling, so the city began looking for a site for another cemetery. In April 1820, the city purchased the land for the Church Street graveyard, although burials were being made in 1819 while the negotiations for the purchase were still going on. The known burials in Campo Santo were eventually moved to Church Street. The land for the graveyard was purchased for $20 from William and Joshua Kennedy. It was a square measuring 417 feet on each side and was located right out here, a half mile outside the city. Since no one knew the cause of yellow fever, they felt it was necessary to bury the victims far from the city to avoid the spread of illness. Church Street was divided into thirds, one-third for Protestants, one-third for Catholics. The remaining third was divided into areas for Masons and Oddfellows, Veterans, Strangers, and <coughs> Potter's Field. Church Street contains the graves of many of Mobile's earliest settlers. 
from Don Miguel de Slava, who served as the collector of customs and treasurer for Spanish Louisiana, to General Edmund Gaines, a hero of the Creek Wars in the War of 1812, and many, many others. Unfortunately, Church Street Graveyard was so small that within just a few years, it was almost completely sold out or used. Except for a few burials, the last recorded burial in Church Street officially was that of three-year-old Virginia Gaines Mitchell in July of 1898. In 1836, while Mobile was once again in the midst of a yellow fever epidemic, the city purchased 30 acres of land beyond the city limits and opened what was first called the New Burial Ground. The name was changed about a year later by the Board of Aldermen to Magnolia Cemetery. We can use this aerial photo to look at the main portion of Magnolia as it was in 1836 and as it is today. Starting as a 30-acre parcel, the cemetery now covers over 100 acres with 90 sections and well over 100,000 individual burials. It is one of the oldest and largest Victorian era cemeteries in the southeastern United States and one of the finest examples of a 19th century cemetery in the country. Now before we move on to some of the historic grave sites and the art and symbolism in Magnolia, let's take a minute to explode one of the most common bits or myths or bits of misinformation about Magnolia Cemetery. This involves the most basic questions. Where is Magnolia Cemetery? And what is and is not Magnolia Cemetery? Magnolia is one cemetery situated in four distinct locations in the Anne, Virginia, and Owen Streets area. Many people think that the areas on either side of Virginia Street, which contain the graves of thousands of United States veterans, are just sections of Magnolia. They are not. Other people think that the two areas on Owen Street set aside for the burial of members of the Jewish temple and synagogue are just sections of Magnolia. That too is incorrect. On the other hand, I can't tell you how many people in Mobile think that Little Magnolia, the Magnolia Annex, and the area which holds the Greek Orthodox section on Owen Street are not part of Magnolia. This too is incorrect. This color-coded plat indicates the four separate parts of Magnolia as well as the two totally different and distinct cemeteries in the area. Everything in light green is Magnolia. That includes the main portion of the cemetery on the north side of Virginia Street, Magnolia Cemetery Number 2, which is commonly called Little Magnolia, on the south side of Virginia Street, the Magnolia Annex, located on Owen Street, several blocks south of Virginia Street, next to the city animal shelter, and the Greek Orthodox community lot across Owen Street from the animal shelter. Four distinct locations, but all part of Magnolia Cemetery. The areas shown on this map in yellow are the two sections of the Mobile National Veterans Cemetery, which is owned and operated by the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, a totally separate cemetery, which is administered by the National Cemetery Office in Pensacola, Florida. They don't have an office here. Finally, the areas shown on the map in orange make up the two Jewish congregation cemeteries owned and operated by the synagogue and the temple. Neither the National Cemetery nor the Jewish congregation cemeteries have anything to do with Magnolia. This is very important since I'm not able to help researchers locate graves in either of those cemeteries. We are neighbors, but we are not all one cemetery. There are well over, as I said, 100,000 individual grave sites or individual burials in Magnolia. And every single one of them is historically significant in some way or to someone. I try to highlight as many as possible that pertain to the different subjects of my various tours and presentations. Now, due to a, a technical glitch with my computer at, at my office, I don't have pictures of these graves but I will tell you about them and we'll highlight some of the tours and presentations. The Mardi Gras tour includes the founders of Mobile's Mardi Gras, Magno, uh, Michael Kraft, 
and George Huggins, who were married in Magnolia. They started the Calvellian to Rankin Society, Mobile's first mystic society in the early 1800s. It was these men who started Mardi Gras as we know it today, with mystic societies uh, that sponsored parades and balls. In the Church Street graveyard, you find the grave of Joe Kane. Kane restarted Mardi Gras following the Civil War. Contrary to lots of people's belief in Mobile, he did not start Mardi Gras. The monuments of all three of these Mardi Gras pioneers are often draped with strings of beads. Tours and presentations about the people who established and grew our city and our state, what one might call the movers and shakers tour, would include the grave of Henry Hitchcock. He came to Alabama in 1816 in his twenties as a young lawyer, and his accomplishments while he was here were monumental and include serving as territorial, territorial governor, Alabama's first attorney general, the first chief justice of the state Supreme Court. He also wrote the first book published in the state and provided most of the money to build Barton Academy, Alabama's first high school. Mover and shaker uh, also would include Walter Bellingrad, who founded the Coca-Cola Bottling Company in Mobile and who, along with his wife, Bessie, established the world-famous Bellingraph Gardens. Our African-American History and Heritage Tour includes the grave sites of Reverend Shandy Jones, a minister of the AME Church, who was, who was a nationally known figure in the Back to Africa movement prior to the Civil War, and one of the, uh, one of the group of black men elected to the Alabama legislature during Reconstruction. <laughs> Miss Betty Hunter was a freed slave who worked hard and saved her money until she and her brother could buy horses and a wagon and start a delivery service. She used profits from that business to buy real estate. She was one of the largest landowners in the city when she died at the young age of 27. Mr. John Floor, a contemporary and friend of Dr. King, who served as director, executive director of the Mobile branch of the NAACP for 50 years and was the first African American elected to the Alabama legislature since Reconstruction. I believe that was in the mid 1970s. Our Women of Magnolia tour would include Nurse Kate Cummin, known as the Florence Nightingale of the Confederacy. She had no formal training, but spent the entire Civil War taking care of soldiers in hospitals. It would also include Augusta Evans Wilson, one of the most widely read writers of the 19th century and the first American woman to earn over $100,000 from her writing. Our military history tour and presentations would include the graves in Magnolia of veterans who served since the War of 1812, six Confederate generals, and other military people like Julian White Whiting, for whom Fort Whiting Armory is named. He served in the Confederate States Army as captain of artillery at Fort Morgan. After the Civil War, he joined the Alabama National Guard and rose to the rank of Major General thus having the distinction of being an officer in both the Confederate and U.S. militaries. The final part of my presentation includes my favorite subject, art and artistic symbolism in a Victorian cemetery. The Victorians were the first to actually plan their cemeteries. They began the concept of large, well-planned, beautifully landscaped cemeteries. One of Magnolia's many faces is its natural beauty, perhaps most typified by the massive ancient oak trees. Magnolia contains hundreds of flowering shrubs and trees, and beside their beauty, many of these trees and shrubs have symbolic meanings. The firs and other evergreens represent eternal life. The cedars represent the Temple of Jerusalem, Weeping willows are for sorrow. Holly symbolizes life during the death of winter. Palm trees symbolize rejoicing and resurrection. 
And then, of course, there are the southern flowering evergreens, like the magnolia, the camellia, and the palmetto. We also have the hibiscus mutabilis, otherwise known as the Confederate rose. As we wander this historic place, we are most struck by the magnificent monuments in these places of sleep. Stones or piles of stones were probably first used to protect graves from marauding animals. At some point in ancient times, someone scratched something on one of these stones and thus began the custom of inscribing gravestones. <coughs> these stones became bigger and more elaborate until, as we have seen, we reach the point of gravestones like the pyramids. In the Christian era, stones became smaller and smaller, except for the nobility, who often had their effigies carved while they were still living, and usually showing them carved as they looked in, in their youth. We begin to see the extensive use of symbolisms in America with smaller colonial headstones. Most of this symbolism was very simple, but some was quite bizarre, like the skull and crossbones on a stone in Boston. In the 19th century, stones became larger once again. Some of this was just the Victorian love for the elaborate, but it was also to protect graves once again from marauders, this time human marauders. With advances in medical science, especially surgery, there was a great need for bodies for anatomical study. Grave robbers, known as resurrection men, had a lucrative occupation. But the Victorians did not just protect the graves, they celebrated them. When you look at monuments in a Victorian cemetery, it's important to look at the monument in general, but then to get move in for a closer look. And try to zero in. You might be surprised at what you would have missed without a closer look. Zero in, and you might find a butterfly, a symbol of rebirth and the only insect I've ever seen on a monument there. You might not give a tiny, seemingly insignificant stone a second glance, but if you zeroed in, you would see that it is topped by a carving of a dead dove lying on its back, probably the most unusual carving I've ever seen on a monument. You might see the tall obelisk, but not the sprigs of ivy tied with a tiny ribbon. You might not notice, or you might notice, the unusual urn on the top of a monument, but miss the Greek key pattern carved above the four-leaf clover. You might see a small marble monument but not the bouquet of roses lying atop a small carved death couch. You might see a magnificent monument with carved cannon, but not the sailing ship and the stylized egg and dart molding. You might even pass right by some unobtrusive monuments and miss the anchor or the delicate lilies of the valley. Many occupations are represented in Magnolia. Mobile's connection with the sea can be seen in the many beautifully carved ships. Organizations and groups built magnificent monuments on lots given to them by the city of Mobile like the larger than life-sized statue of a man standing at a hoist on the Working Men's Timber and Cotton Benevolent Association. Another organization for the, lot, uh, for the dock and warehouse workers is the Bay Men's Benevolent Association, with a monument carved like a stack of cotton bales, topped with a cotton bale on a wagon and surrounded by the other tools of the trade. There were fraternal organizations like the Woodmen of the World with unusual monuments made to look like trees and logs. We find helmets and megaphones on the Firemen's Association lot and a carved fire hydrant on the grave of Matthew Sloan, Mobile's first fire chief. The monument for Edward Morris, a police officer killed in the line of duty in 1901, 
was placed and dedicated by the people of a grateful city. It contains a hand-carved rendition of an old city seal with the sailing vessel and the cotton bale and plant. Square 22 contains the monument to the men lost on the British steamship Mobile, placed by the people of her namesake city. She sank with all hands in December of 1900, bound for Germany. Many legends and tales of phantoms and ghosts and mystery surround Magnolia. There is the Iron Lady on the Rowan family lot, facing always to the south, watching for her long-lost sailor to return. Some say any attempt to move this legendary lady incites horrible storms off the Gulf. Actually, she is a cast-iron statue entitled Solemnity. She looks solemn, doesn't she? This was purchased from the catalog of Wood and Perot of Philadelphia and New Orleans. Peek through the cross-shaped opening in the door of the Farley Memorial Building and see the ghost of Mr. Owen Farley materialize out of the back wall of the structure. In better light, we see that it is a beautiful marble statue of Mr. Farley, although people think it's a ghost. Some say that the chest tomb of William and Sarah Cottrell contains the body of Mr. Cottrell's horse, Buchanan, winner of the 10th Kentucky Derby in 1884. It's been extra it does continue. <laughs> it is said that on the darkest nights, phantom funeral processions can still be seen entering Magnolia through the George Street Gate at the north side of the cemetery. Dr. Josiah Knott's four young children, Sarah, Emma, Alan, and Edward, all died of yellow fever between September 15 and 19 of 1853, a period of less than a week. Reports from the Times say that the children's little spaniel dog stayed at their bedsides while they were sick and then died too within a few weeks of the children's passing. Legend says that on cloudy winter afternoons when the wind blows chill from the north, those standing near the beautiful monument of the weeping woman can hear the faint sound of the woman crying. Each night between 9 and 10 o'clock, the very distinct sound of footsteps can be heard from the second floor of the gatehouse in the Mobile National Cemetery. Victorians treated their cemeteries like their houses and their clothing. There was almost never too much or anything too elaborate. Their love for the Gothic, the Egyptian, and especially classical architecture and building found full expression in their cemeteries. The Victorians loved what would now be considered pagan symbols. While nearly every monument in Magnolia contains some sort of Judeo-Christian symbolism, it is mixed with non-religious pagan symbols. The ancient world can be seen in Greek death symbols like the urn, the shroud, and the charnel house. Perhaps one of the best examples of this is the Troost Monument, which contains all of those symbols. Or the Obelisk, which can be seen everywhere one looks in these old places. Throughout Victorian cemeteries, we see this mixture of pagan and Christian symbolism. We see it in the architecture, the Egyptian-inspired pier and lintel style of mausolea and crypts. <clears throat> and the Greek columns, which are also everywhere one looks. The urn, the column, the laurel, the shroud, botanical and animal symbolism, all can be seen mixed with the cross, the angel, the Bible, even mausolea resembling Gothic churches. And of course there are many, many other Christian symbols. 
Most of the monuments are of marble or granite, but there are also unusual monuments made of cast iron and cast iron mausoleum. And even more unusual, the scarabaeus, made of iron, is a grave covering, shaped like an Egyptian scarab or a Victorian Easter egg. Perhaps the most fascinating, at least to me, the most fascinating thing about 19th century cemeteries is the extensive and elaborate use of that symbolism. Much of it is military symbolism and is obvious. The cannon and shells for an artillery officer. The flags, cannon, swords, bugle, anchor, and all of the symbols of a naval officer. The cap, coat, sword, and even the highly polished battle flag of a Confederate officer. The unusual symbol of crossed swords on the monument of two brothers, officers serving in the Confederate cavalry. One is the unsheathed or naked sword for the one who died in combat. The other, his brother's, is the sheathed sword because he died of exposure and exhaustion after the battle. As I said, religious symbols are everywhere. We find the cross of Christ and the pagan symbol of the laurel of victory and virtue lying on the bed and pillow of a child. There are the cherubs of innocence on the stones of three little girls, each angel a different size representing the age of the child. The broken stems of the unopened rose, the bud of an infant, and the barely opened blossom of a child. Sometimes these buds were shown with arrows shot through them, perhaps suggesting sudden death or the pierced hearts of the parents. <clears throat> a small bouquet of roses with three broken stems and carved infants lying on funeral beds but in the attitude of sleep, not death. Their legs or feet, or feet are crossed and they're touching their heart or touching their face. This is an attitude of sleep. Plants and other botanical symbols are almost as prevalent as religious symbols, like the bouquet of flowers for beauty and abundance. Weeping willows of sadness surround the draped urn of death. Again, the laurel, ancient symbol of virtue and victory. The lily symbolizes purity and resurrection. A sheath of wheat is for the abundance of God and the bread of life. A palm is for pilgrimage, rejoicing, and victory in Christ. Ivy, like all evergreens, symbolizes eternal life. The oak and acorn symbolize life, fertility, and immortality. An ear of corn is for God's harvest, and the thistle represents remembrance. The entwined rose and lily, husband and wife, his life stem is broken, but there is hope in the hereafter. We find expressions of eternal love between husband and wife, mother and father, and of course, that special love, a mother's love. The beautiful McKinstry Monument has corner bar carvings of the theological virtues. Faith and hope, love and mercy. Strange symbolism for a cemetery perhaps, but we see Bacchus, the god of wine and revelry on a flower box. Must have been big in the Mardi Gras. The winged hourglass of fleeting time draped with flowers and surrounded by the snake, an ancient symbol of healing forming the circle of eternity. And in many places around these cemeteries you will see the crown of glory with the glory streaming from it. The column represents life. The broken column represents a life cut short. 
and often the end of the family's name or male line. The short column of a child and the nearly complete column of a man in his 20s. The broken column with a beautiful carving of an uprooted sapling, not only a life cut short, but the ripping up of the family tree. The anchor is the symbol of hope. The open book can represent the Bible or the book of life. The orb is a symbol for the spirit. The orb has wings as the spirit takes flight to the world above. The shell and the bowl and pitcher represent cleansing and baptism. <clears throat> there are lamps and torches to represent the light of knowledge and wisdom and the light of eternal life. But there are also inverted torches to represent the extinguishing of the light of mortal life. And there are angels everywhere, comforting angels. Mournful angels. The angel Gabriel signaling the person to stay in the grave until the sounding of the final trumpet. There are angels reading the book and angels escorting the souls to heaven. or awaiting those souls in a heavenly home. <clears throat> and there are angels at prayer. But there are other beings, sometimes mistaken for angels. These creatures have no wings. They are the ancient Greek symbol of the mourning woman. Sometimes she leans on a cross with covered brow. Sometimes she stands boldly with the water jug and plate as the keeper of home and family. At other times, she leans on or holds the anchor of hope. The Victorians love the comparison of death with sleep. Even in monuments, this typical Victorian bed monument has a headboard, a footboard, and side rails, all pointing to the loved ones only sleeping. A motif found quite often in these cemeteries is symbolizing the family as a bouquet of flowers. One loved one has left the family circle. One flower has dropped from the family bouquet. The egg and dart molding that is so popular in houses these days is that represents life, the egg, and death, the dart or arrow. In fact, the Williamson Monument here is an explosion of Victorian symbolism. It is a complete column for a complete life. It has egg and dart molding, the climbing ivy of eternal life, the hourglass of fleeting mortality, and the winged orb of the spirit rising to heaven. Animals are also very common symbols. The dove represents the Holy Spirit and purity, or the dove returning with the olive branch to Noah after the flood to symbolize not peace, but rebirth and a new existence. Lambs symbolize Christ, the Lamb of God, sacrifice, and especially with children, innocence. Here, the innocent lamb is cradled in the arms of the Heavenly Father. Dogs are symbols of loyalty and fidelity, courage and vigilance. We already saw the 
than a knockoff. <laughs> the lion is the symbol of valor and an Egyptian guardian of the tomb. This lion has seen better days, but he's still there. For thousands of years, the butterfly has symbolized rebirth. Even mythical beasts are used, like the griffin, half eagle and half lion, another ancient guardian of the dead. This griffin is found on one of the two cast iron mausolea in Magdala. Now, we're short of time, but really, if we had a week, I still wouldn't be able to show you all of the symbols <coughs> and uh, statuary in Magnolia. We've got a few more slides here that will show you some of them. Here in a Victorian cemetery, it is easy to get lost in the 19th century. But at some point, we look up to the horizon and realize that we are actually still in the 21st century. But isn't it strange that as we look at that horizon, we still see Victorian and therefore ancient architectural influences? These beautiful historic places of sleep are unique in so many ways. They are important as landmarks, as museums, and as places of remembrance. It is up to us to see that they are preserved, not only for ourselves, but more importantly, for our children and for all future generations. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I've enjoyed being with you. Three handouts for you today. This one is the most common <coughs> Victorian funerary symbols, so you'll have them. I know you y'all go wandering around cemeteries all the time, so they're good for any Victorian cemetery. Uh, this one is uh, about Victorian burial custom. We didn't talk a lot about the myths and legends, but this has to do with the fact that people are not buried six feet deep and the difference between a coffin and a casket and that kind of thing. And then this one page one, because I know most of you, if not all of you, are interested in genealogy, um, it tells you, first of all, that they're not a genealogy library. We don't know who's related to who and how they're related, if they are related. But it does tell you, if you want record information on people buried in Magnolia, how to go about obtaining that information. So, questions? Well, I think you've already answered Yeah, that's why, that's why I, I cut you off, because I figured out. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of people, I don't know why this is, but people always want to go to the cemetery, I guess because that's where the, their ancestors are, thinking, and I believe me, I've had people walk in the door with something this thick and say, I'm doing my genealogy, I want you to find all these people and tell me how I'm related to them. <laughs> we can't do that. First of all, if you walk in, we're not going to take that. You have to write to us. But, you know, we, we know who's buried, when they were buried, where they were buried. Uh, a lot of people assume that because when you go to a funeral home and you give that funeral director all kind of information about the parents' names and the brothers and sisters and children and all that, that the cemetery gets that. That's funeral home information that is used for the obituary notes. We don't get it, and we don't have it. Now, in the last 25 years or so, we've kept copies of obituary notices, but you can get those just as easily as um, we can help you with the dead end of your genealogy research, which is always the la at the end of that each generation where the person's buried and when they die. That we can help you with. And a lot of times we only know the date they were buried. If they don't have a headstone, all we have is the date of burial, not the date of death. Any others? Yes, sir. Uh, I've noticed a few of the older headstones have, uh, well, in, in particular, French and German language 
Norwegian. I think I, that I know is some Scandinavian too. Mm -hmm. and There's also a bit of Latin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So were these linguistic communities that kind of died out in Mobile, or were these just uh, immigrant families who happened to have died? Well, they're, I mean, they're still around. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing you, you'll find in Magnolia, and I assume, I don't know this for certain, but I assume that in many cases, uh, you know, people that were all German lived in the same neighborhoods or whatever because they wanted to live near their friends or whatever. You'll find, and, and one thing I always make clear to people because I have people who are writing books or whatever contact me and ask, when was uh, Magnolia racially integrated? And I tell them, 1836, the day it was over. It was never segregated by race. But what you will find is what I call self-segregation. And that's because if I buy a cemetery lot, you know, my brother's going to buy his near mine, or my sister is, or my cousin is, maybe a friend or a neighbor. So you'll find in areas a large concentration of, of African American families, a large concentration of German families or Irish families or whatever, because they bought lots to be geographically near their friends and their relatives. So that happens a lot. But, um, you know, I think obviously those, those communities have spread out now. Still a lot of families in Mobile of German descent and Irish descent. Uh, but you don't see it as much, you know, concentrated like you do in an old cemetery. Do <laughs> anything for your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah, they haven't died out. They just have spread yeah. out, integrated, and right. yeah, and assimilated. Um, kind of like but it's just interesting, especially with the, uh, the the Scandinavian headstones that I saw. So that uh, <coughs> many know. Was this a large concentration of them all in one place, and all of them in Scandinavian? Or uh, they were they were kind of scattered, but within the same region. Um, is this some, anywhere near the uh, city animal shelter? No, 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 okay. no. This was more in the center. Okay. Yes. Because there is the Norwegian <laughs> Siemens lot, which is adjacent to the Greek Orthodox mm -hmm. uh, lot, and everybody in there is Norwegian. Yeah, I didn't know that we had a huge yeah. Norwegian community. Well, the Norwegian so. Siemens ministry was actually a ministry of a church, a Protestant church uh, in Norway. And they spread all over the world. And, and in port cities, they would actually have a chapel where these Norwegian sailors could go to church, and you know they fed them sometimes or put them up or whatever. And I didn't know this. I just thought my my first thought when I saw that lot was it must have been an epidemic that everybody on this ship died. But they're all different years. Um, the what the chapel that they had, the Norwegian Seamen's Ministry Chapel in New Orleans closed about two years ago, and that was the last one in the United States. Mm -hmm. But there was one in Mobile for a hundred years, and that, you know, the city gave organizations and clubs and groups and unions and whoever wanted a lot, they gave them a lot for their members, and so that's why they gave that lot to the Norwegian Sailors Ministry, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why they're all there. Mm -hmm. That's the Right. I guess so. Is there a potter's field or an indigent section in which you have names? There are several of them around Magnolia. We do have names. The unfortunate thing, and this applies to the, all the way back to the beginning with Victorians, they didn't think in terms of genealogy. And they didn't think in terms that we need to be able to trace this. And especially with indigents because the definition of an indigent back then was the same it is now. There's no family, there's no no one. So you'll find death certificates, thousands of them, that will say place of internment, Magnolia Cemetery, Paul, period. That could be in any, sometimes with the year we can determine about where it is, but in most cases we have no idea except that it's somewhere in Magnolia. They aren't marked. Now if they're marked, we have record of everybody that has the headstone. Most of the time they weren't. They also, uh, you'll see a lot of death certificates, and this was just, uh, what's the technical word? Being knuckleheads. Um, you'll see the initials, you'll see Magnolia Cemetery or MC, and then you'll see PC. Well, they had something, public ground, that was the indigent area, that was the Potter's Field, public ground. But you also had something called pay graves, and what that was, you didn't buy a whole family lot family or whoever made the arrangements just paid for a grave. 
Well, clerks being clerks, everything is always abbreviated. And oddly enough, the abbreviation for public ground and pay grade is PG. So quite often with PGs, we don't know whether they're indigents or whether they're actually uh, in, a, in a pay grade. And we have records on a lot of those. You know, uh, at least we know who they are and when they were buried. Since most of them, even them, most of them are not marked. That's all we know. Are there sexton records or anything for Church Street? Uh, about the only records, I think Chuck Torrey has a lot of records at the History Museum, but I think he's still in the process of trying to index them some way so that they would make sense. Keep in mind, most of the time, cemetery records are kept in chronological order, so if you don't know when the person died, you, you can't find yeah, well, This was mid-1800s. Um, but I do have all the records. What records we have, I have at my office. And so you can write to me and say that you think they're in Church Street. Problem is with Church Street, we have headstone records and we have uh, death certificates and, and sextons records that people have brought to us over the years. So we probably have about 25% of the people actually buried. Somebody, I saw someone back there. I'll come right back to you. Didn't somebody back there have a question? Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey. Um, I, a few years ago, I published two books in Georgia. I transcribed greater than 15,000 tombstones. Well, good for you. To Georgia. Better you than me. And, <laughs> and at the time, a cemetery historian advised me, because this was all rural, mm -hmm. you know, so there was no Catholic cemetery, right. you know, or right. anything like that, right. where there was an order. Right. So it was grandma went out in the field and said, I want to bury, bury him right there. Bury him right there. So this friend said, what I would suggest is try to do a row and marker system. So I would start in the most eastern corner and just walk them up. And I made the straight lines because mm -hmm. nobody's buried in a straight line right. in a rural mm -hmm. cemetery. But so, you know, it would be uh, row one, grade one. If it was husband and wife, they got the same number and right. so on. I also have friends that organize them alphabetically. Nobody dies alphabetically. Nobody dies right. chronologically. <laughs> they, have to be, they have to be cross referenced They have to be done chronologically and then cross referenced alphabetically. So, so because and this would also get me in great trouble because I would, I would in, inevitably put people together that weren't family, right. and I have some little elderly woman just cussed me out that I put, you know, the prostitute next to grandpa, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. No, and so, so do, you, do you have any suggestions if some, I want to do this in the future, is there another way to do it? Well, first of all, never make one record on two people, ever, ever, ever. Okay. okay. Because they may not be connected, even if they're husband and wife. The only time you would do that is if they're buried in, as a double burial. If there's one stone that has both names on it, uh, depending on the cemetery, you may be able to assume that they're buried one atop the other, okay, which was done in a lot of cemeteries, Most including times. Magnolia. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you've got John Smith and Mary, even if it says Mary Smith, wife of John Smith, give her her own designation of location. And, and that I have done, and do you, do you find any harm in trying to make row in order? No, no, it, you know, that's fine. Uh, when you find one on one end, um, measure it off as, as eight to 10 feet. Yeah. Uh, pull strings so that you see if you've got straight lines, because there will be people that are skewed. Mm -hmm. And then just designate it as a number. <laughs> yeah. And make sure that you're, that, that mm -hmm. as you map it, and it's always, not just to keep records, it's best to map it. Um, and people, everybody does GPS and all that. Um, a simple line and straight edge drawing is always helpful. And I don't talk to all the time, but to, to, to answer what you said, in the index, I did index for the surname and maiden name. So I did go that extra step that, right. that, that assuming that name in yes. the middle of her name was her yeah. maiden name. Yeah. And that's fine, and, and, but, and you bring up a, a, a valid point. Um, I love genealogists. As long as they're properly cooked, they're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they do make mistakes. They do make mistakes um, 
that are are not mistakes for genealogists, but they are mistakes when you come to a cemetery. Genealogists keep women by their maiden name. No, but now, women keep their maiden name nowadays, but this didn't happen in the 1800s and up until recent years. Don't write to me and ask me for Mary Smith, and then when I tell you she's not here, and, they, and you say, I know she is, she's buried in 1942, I know she's there. I'm sorry, I don't have a record of her. Well, I don't understand because her husband, Mr. Jones, is there. <laughs> she's not Mary Smith, she's Mary Jones. And I spend a great deal of, and I'm not complaining about this so much, uh, but I spend a great deal of useless time looking up women by their maiden names when in fact when they're buried, they're buried by their married name. I always tell genealogists, if Mary Smith was married four times, but she got married to the ambulance attendant on the way to the hospital to die. Wow. His name is the one she was buried. <laughs> <laughs> I've had people say, well, she was married four times, but the one that we like the best. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't care which one you like the best. I need to know the last one. Even if you hated him, I need to know the last one. So remember uh, that you know sometimes the maiden information is good. If, if, if the lot is full of Coopers and you're looking for Mary Smith, it's nice to know that she was a Cooper because she's in her, her family's lot, her parents' lot. But just don't look for them by their maiden name. Uh, the other thing is, did I tell you I love genealogists? <laughs> do they taste like chicken? <laughs> Please don't tell me when they were born, because I couldn't care less. Because I'm not a maternity hospital. I'm a cemetery. I don't mean that in a facetious way that I don't care. I care about everybody that's in my cemetery. They're all like my family members. But if you write to me and say, Mary Cooper, she was born in 1863. I need to know when she died, because that's what my record, my record don't, if they have a birth date, it's only because they have a stone and we picked it up off the stone. But genealogists are, and I, I, sometimes I think they're just trying to impress me with how far back their family goes, and I'm happy for you. But I need the date that they died. And I don't have to have the exact date. Uh, when people write, when you write to me, you can tell me, they died, you know, they were in the 1924, 20 census and they weren't in the 19, I, I don't mind checking that. But I do need an era because that determines where in my office I go for the information. So was it 1800s? Was it, you know, the 1930s? Was it last week, you know? Um, and while we're on the subject of genealogists, did I tell you how much I love genealogists? <laughs> I had a man threaten to sue me after a presentation like this one day because he said, I'm going to call you because my somebody, great cousin, twice removed or somebody, he died about five years ago, and I want you to give me the information on the people that made his arrangements and what their names, addresses, and phone numbers. <laughs> and I said, well, you're welcome to write to me because I love hearing from people, but I can't give you any of that information. That, that's covered by privacy laws. I can't give you any of that. Well, I bet you you'll give it to me if I sue you. I said, I bet I will. <laughs> <laughs> Doing what judges order me to do is one of my favorite pastimes. But no judge is going to order me to give living people's information to someone. And his argument was, well, you know they're dying to hear from their relatives. And I said, I don't know that. I got relatives. I don't want them to know where I am. <laughs> I assure you, most of them I'm all right with, but there are a number of them. I just assume they think that I live in, you know, Oklahoma or something. <laughs> so don't ask me for living people's information. I can give you everything that is public record, and that's certainly everything on the headstone. Um, and if there was an obituary notice, and we have some that go way back, not all of them. Um, but I can give you a copy of that. That was public record when it was public, so I can give you a copy of that as the relatives. We have a lot of documents, and since uh, I got to know uh, Tracy, I've gotten a lot more documents. She's made my workload go up by about 50%. Like, you know, she works me to death. We do have a lot of death certificates. We do have a lot of sextance records. We do have a lot of obituary notices. But we don't have them on everyone, and we don't have the same records on everyone. If you write to me, and you want to know about uh, William Cooper, okay, and you tell me he died sometime in the 1940s, all right, I'm not going to just send you information on William Cooper. I'm going to send you information on everybody buried in that lot 
and I'm gonna send you any documents, copies of any documents that I have. Now, this is the reason that you wanna to write to me and follow that handout rather than dropping by, because I never have understood why people think they can just drop by and they'll get more information. If I'm in the middle of arranging a funeral or I'm on the way out to a funeral, you're, you'll be lucky if I can just give you a map to take you to it. If you write to me and give me, we ask for four to six weeks, normally I'll get this out within two weeks. Most of the time, on average, I send people a packet that is 12 to 14 pages of stuff. Photographs of the lot, all of the headstone inscriptions, database record, a diagram of the lot showing where everybody's buried, maps to find the lot, aerial photographs like you saw in this presentation. I'll send you a ton of stuff, but write to me, because that's how you get it. So, I'll tell you about this young lady, because this is a typical genealogy, although I call these people Tuesday morning genealogists. You ever met any of those? They wake up on Tuesday morning and say, I'm gonna do my family tree today. <laughs> <laughs> she came into my office, and she bounced in, and that's not, that's not any kind of gender sexist remark. She was so excited, she was just about to blow up. <laughs> and she came bouncing into my office, and she said, is this, is this the records office? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, are you the records keeper? I said, yes, ma'am, how may I help you? She said, I want all the information you have on my great grandma. I said, no problem at all, what was her name? Don't you know? <laughs> said, no, I'm not, I'm not psychic, I don't know. <laughs> Unless you tell me. And she said, well, this is one hell of a records office. You don't even know the names of the people you got buried here. And got up, walked out, slammed the door behind <laughs> And believe it or not, that is not the strangest thing that happens to me <laughs> on a weekly basis. So if you ever, if you ever come in and say, I want all the, I, if, if I'm ever short with you, I will apologize in advance because I deal with a lot of knuckleheads. <laughs> I had a guy one time tell me, and I know especially with young people, they think technology's always been around. It's always been. And I'm going to quote him exactly because it wasn't so much what he said, it was how he said it. He called me and he said, I'm looking for information on my great great grand somebody who's buried in the Confederate section. And I said, okay, what was his name? He gave me his name. And, and I looked him up and I said, guess what we have? He said, well, he was whatever, married uh, Jonathan Cooper and he died on October the 15th, 1862 and he was in the 21st Alabama Regiment. And I said, yes sir, and what do you want from me? I, you know, that's all I have. What do you mean that's all you have? I said, well, that far back, all we have is what's on the headstone. You know, especially in wartime, you know. He said, that's a city cemetery. I said, yes, sir. You work for the city, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, now, I'm not blaming this on you because I'm sure you weren't there. Nice of him to say I wasn't there in 1862. <laughs> but he said, you know, that's typical of that lazy bureaucrat. And I quote, how hard would it have been for him to run off copies of his military personal information? So I gave him the benefit of the doubt. You know, I'm not much of a computer wizard, but I did go online and I Googled the Confederate Copier Corps. <laughs> but apparently it was a very secretive branch of the Confederate government because I never found a thing. <laughs> So again, if I'm ever a little bit terse with you when you come in the door and I'm trying to get out to go to a funeral, forgive me in advance. <laughs> um, but I deal with that, and people like Tracy. <laughs> Tracy's one. Y'all are genealogists. You know how to ask for this stuff. And you know, I can't help you with how you're, I've had people say, well, I don't know. I saw in the paper that Mrs. Lipschitz is gonna be buried uh, over there Tuesday. Yes, ma'am, she is. How am I related to her? <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know how you're related to Ms. Lipschitz. You might want to ask somebody in the family. Yes, ma'am. Is anybody doing those kind of monuments anymore? The great big, huge ones? I mean, just fabulous. Yeah, uh, most of the ones that are really intricate now are done in, in China. Uh, for the most part, but there are monument companies. They don't like to do them in marble anymore because it's so soft and it's so easy to break one and then you've got to eat it and marble tastes like a 
Um, so most of them are done in granite, but they are doing that. Most of the stones in Magnolia, nobody's asked about all the dirty stones there, so I don't answer it even though nobody has. Um, that's Alabama marble, which is some of the softest marble in the world. It's also some of the finest, purest marble on earth. The Italians used to come over and get blocks of it to take back to Italy to carve statues of it. It comes from uh, Gomer Pyle's hometown, Sonicata, and in that area. But it's very fine grained. It has very little marble and very few lines in it. But because it is so soft, it's great for carving all this entry. On the other hand, because it's soft, it lets in air pollution and salt, which we have a great deal of. So all of that blackened and discolored stuff is Alabama marble. And it can be cleaned. Uh, they make a stuff now that's G6, G7. How many? D2. 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 And we are still time testing it because I've, I've had problems with cleaners in the past where, oh, it not work. It's great. It's spray it on and leave it on. And six months later, it's time to turn green. So I'm still, I'm going to time test it for at least three years before I will, uh, you know, recommend its general use. But it's spray and leave on, and it, from what I can tell, it really does a good job. Now, you can high pressure wash, wash that stuff, but you need to start off at garden hose pressure and slowly bring it up. And that's after inspecting the stone very carefully because it gets these little fissures and cracks in it that you can't see. And people will, you know, I'll get this thing clean, crank it up to 6,000 PSI and blow the thing into pieces. Uh, the only thing you never want to do is use bleach. Because the bleach, when the sun hits it, it will yellow it. Um, a very mild solution of swimming pool chlorine, which does not contain salt, uh, is useful. But really, a soft brush and water with a uh, like Dawn dishwasher detergent, a real mild detergent. Except for the D2, once we know it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And I wouldn't but, dare try to compare story for story. But, oh, come on. Show me. But, but, but I have to tell this one funny thing. I was hired by this lady who the whole entire silver tea service was in her mouth, not just the spoon. And so I was uh, doing this cemetery for her. And she came to me one day and she said, I want to ask your opinion on something. And I said, what is it? And she said, well, I'm trying to manicure my family's plot, and I have moved my grand my great grandmother's tombstone to be with the rest of the family, but I didn't have the body moved. So what do you think? And I said, I said you really want to know what I think? And she said, yes. And I said, well, when Jesus returns and there's resurrection Sunday, she will pop out of the grave and not know who she is. <laughs> that was not an answer. And I <laughs> I did have a man uh, when I was at the Catholic Cemetery, when I ran the Catholic Cemetery, we moved him four times. His wife kept wanting to get a bigger lot or she decided she liked to go under the tree or whatever. And one of my my uh, crewmen told me one time at the fourth time we moved, he said, you know, when Jesus comes back, this man ain't gonna know where his body is. <laughs> I said, well, you got a point. Uh, but you know, oddly enough, I do recommend, I never recommend you move the stone. Uh, but we have, and, and I guess off the top of my head, I would say that where it's most common is with infants that were buried, that they had a, an infant reception in that home. And it was the city cemetery, so that's where indigents were buried until we ran out of room. Now the county pays to bury indigents, we stopped. And people will say, well, my mother passed away and she's buried in the family cemetery of the country, but she always wanted to move this baby, the, the stillborn baby that she had back in the 1940s. And, you know, I've never had one move because I tell them, you know, a stillborn infant, they didn't bury them in vaults. They buried them in little, pretty little satin covered wooden caskets. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. The bones had not even hardened enough. There's nothing there. But by all means, put a stone in the family lot. And even if you want to say buried in Magnolia Cemetery in Mobile, Alabama, but by all means, mark them. But it doesn't matter to them where they're buried, and it doesn't matter in the afterlife or anything else where they're buried. There's somebody going to take care of all of that. So I'm just, you know, and I, I'm not being calloused. I'm just opposed to moving bodies if you don't absolutely have to do it. Sometimes you do, but uh, it's just not necessary. But if you do have one person buried like in a pay grade, a single grave in Magnolia and everybody else is in 
you know, op. Put a stone in op with uncle whatever his name was, a name on it. And um, just make sure that the family knows. And that, that's one of the reasons you may, especially if it's like a family cemetery, that you actually put on the stone buried in Magnolia Cemetery over there on the mountain because 100 years from now, people will say, well, you know, I got a record that says Uncle Josiah was buried in Mobile. He wasn't buried here. So it's best if everybody knows that. We don't have a record of it. And we, we put in probably a dozen memorial markers every year where it's just the stone. Nowadays, people get cremated and scattered over the Gulf and all that stuff. Uh, I still suggest that people put a stone, even though we don't sell them. You know, I suggest that people put a stone because that people should have a place they can go and say, this is my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents, my uncles and aunts. So even if they're not actually buried there, again, where they're buried doesn't make any difference as far as what you can see. But they should be marked, at least in my opinion, they should be marked so that everybody will know that this, that Uncle Josiah was somebody's brother. I'll come right back to you. I saw a hand back there. Somebody keeps raising their hand and raising their hand. Oh, I thought you were playing with me. Remember, I work with dead people all the time. Don't play games with me because I'm easily played. Yes, ma'am. Can you, can you bury ashes in a cemetery? We do it all the time. Uh, about half, about 58% of all of our burials are cremation urns. And that's a good question because most people think you, you have to dispose of them or scatter them or something. If you're Catholic, you have to be buried, cremated or not. Uh, uh, most of the others, like Greek Orthodox, can't be cremated. But um, yeah, we bury. Uh, and one of the things I mentioned earlier about people being buried one atop the other, Magnolia, it used to be fairly common to do double death burials one atop the other. Now that place is too wet. We can't. We can do it. But we may not be able to do it when the person dies, which means we do it single death, and then you've got to pay three or four thousand dollars to come back and move, remove them and lower them and all that. Just be cremated, both of them go in the same space. We allow up to three and actually up to four bear cremation or in burials into its space. Now, Pinecrest doesn't, we'll be able to walk gardens doesn't, and most commercial cemeteries do not. And there's a very good reason for it. They want to sell you more space. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to allow it one burial per grave. We don't require urn vaults, a vault for the urn to go in. There's a very good reason for that, because the cemeteries who require them sell them. So they want you to buy them. That's fine. So is the space that you're buried in uh, when you're cremated, is it the same size as a grave? Or oh, no, no, no. It's, it's a foot it's square. Little, oh, okay. Yeah. So and it's cheaper. Much cheaper. Well, it's half the price. The it's it's half the price. Our interment fee is $1,000 weekday and it's 500 for a cremation and that includes we do a little setup of a little pedestal with a white linen drape and you put the urn on top of it have the service and then you leave and we make it there so it is half as much but you again you have to already own the lot magnolia's been sold out since the 60s there's nothing left to buy anybody else that's it sorry <laughs> I don't mind when uh, Tracy has her hand back like that with a rock and just gets that far back. I know it's coming. Be sure to get the hand down.